Thank you so much to our panel this morning. And gentlemen, let's talk everything travel. So starting with the dark days of COVID, um, no other industry was more impacted than the travel industry. However, most in the industry would argue they certainly didn't waste a, a crisis. So gentlemen, I'd love to hear how each of you have transformed your business during this period. So Jamie, if we could start with you, please. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, hang on. Yeah, morning, everyone. Um, yeah, what was COVID again? No, we we, uh, we don't talk about COVID anymore. We've all moved on, but um, yeah, it's pretty tough. I think we've all talked about that. I, I, I remember um, I remember the date well, March eight, where we had a come to Jesus moment in our business, and by March fourteen, we knew we'd get through it. But it was uh, it was a pretty terrible moment. But the flip side was we were very very lucky. We happened to be cashed up at the time, and I think you guys have a story since then. So we were able to buy some some really good assets that probably would have never sold if it wasn't for COVID. And, and the rest is history. So the business is a lot bigger business than we ever could have been, and um, you know we'll be at least forty percent bigger than we were pre-COVID this year. Record profits this year—that's a no-brainer. And then next year we're looking really good. So it, it's been good for us. Uh, and the other thing is, I, I think you know it's like the enemy you need to have sometimes. You look at things that you don't do that you have to do. Um, I think probably with all the guys now, robotic process and AI is really really big internally in our business now. So investing millions in it. Uh, for, for good results. So what, what can we do really, like all businesses should, what can you do that's not client facing that technology can do and leave you guys to really focus on the customer, which is our business, but that's probably it. And Scott, how have you uh, transformed lines during this period? We, lo we loved COVID. Um, <laughs> we doubled the size of our business. Um, we made a, a lot of money. Um, our customer base um, back then, two, two and a half years ago was, um, Principally, the big mining companies, and um, um, we were able to redeploy when um, Virgin went broke. Uh, we had seven aircraft dedicated to flying for Virgin. It was a pretty big hole in our PL, and uh, we were able to redeploy those um, into Western Australia. Um, and um, the, the way that the big mining companies dealt with COVID was to reduce the number of people flying on each aircraft. So we get paid by the flight, not by the seat. Um, and therefore our customers needed uh, twice as many aircraft. And um, we were we were very fair and reasonable in, in our pricing. Um, and um, we, 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 no, it's not a lot. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's unfair. Um, <laughs> and and um, I mean, BHP has pricing power over us, not vice versa. Someone might like to tell the people see that, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and so we actually did really well. And in the middle of um, uh, 2020, we went to the market and raised $100 million um, and bought a bucket load of aeroplanes that we didn't know what we were going to do with. And we've now uh, deployed all 33 of those aircraft that we bought. Um, and uh, that will sort of milk into our p &L over the next sort of um, 20 months. So a um, little bit like Jamie, you've got to sense and smell opportunity and just have a balance sheet. Um, that's ready for it and, and banking facilities and um, you know, we're all listed public companies so be able, being able to go to the market and raise equity uh, at the appropriate time was, was, was pretty good and uh, we haven't, we haven't uh, regretted anything we did um, as a result of that and now um, uh, because, because essentially we're an essential service we didn't stop the, we, we didn't allow any of our staff to work from home and we still don't so I call on all of you as business leaders to stop this working from home nonsense, right? <laughs> it's got to stop. Um, it's, it's destroying businesses. So thank you for that. And I'll pass on to Screw, who probably may support me or not. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, Scotty. Yeah, well, um, that working from home, I, I, we've got a very, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy for people to work from home as long as it's weekends and public holidays. <laughs> Um, your um, flight center, we weren't quite as lucky as uh, some of the others when it sounds it. Um, but um, I think uh, we had to let go 15,000 people in um, between March and June in uh, 2020. Um, over the two and a half, three years of COVID affected, uh, we've actually, in terms of loss, actual losses and lost profits pre-COVID, it's about $2.3 billion. So that's going to take a while to um, make up. Uh, the good thing is, obviously, we've got some 
tax losses to use up over that time, which is which is a small uh, blessing, I suppose. Um, we we did we we did we have changed a lot. Um, you know, we're back to about thirteen or fourteen thousand people now from uh, 21,000, 22,000 pre-COVID. And uh, this year we'll get back to about 22 billion PDV, which um, is a couple of billion short of uh, uh, pre-COVID. Our margins are lower because the models have changed a bit more online, more, um, more multinational corporations that we won over that period of time. But um, yeah, we are back into reasonable profits this year. And you've seen our, probably seen our forecasts. Um, Still got a long way to go to get back to pre-COVID. And um, uh, at some stage, if Belinda will allow me, I'll tell you what I think about uh, the way our government reacted to COVID uh, and it's been proven dead wrong. Uh, let's hope it doesn't happen again. I think that's one of the things in the travel industry, uh, despite Alliance, I know, uh, you know you, you, you love another pandemic, but um, <laughs> let's hope the stupidity of the government. So, and I have actually received one apology from one of the, um, health ministers of one of the states, I won't tell you which it was, but um, uh, I'm still waiting for Scotty Morrison to uh, to apologise for what they did to um, to our uh, democratic country. Uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Luke? Well, I'm certainly in Screws camp. We hated COVID. About 90% of our business comes from international tourists into the different destinations that we operate around the world. So overnight, we lost that business. But the good news is that when you do go through a crisis, it gives you the chance to look at every single thing in your P&L. So we went through and we cut any unnecessary things. So on the other side, we're a much, much stronger business now. But probably the biggest benefit of COVID was that it brought the two leading RV rental businesses in the world together. So Apollo Tourism and Tourism Holdings Limited merged uh, we also had some challenges with the, the regulators in Australia and New Zealand. So that took over a year uh, to achieve. But where we stand today, we've got two businesses that are on the recovery side of COVID. In fact, business is returning at an absolute rapid rate. And we've got this third business, which is the Synergies. And that's nearly as big as what our independent two businesses were achieving pre-COVID. So the light at the end of the tunnel is that we're a much stronger business coming together. And if it wasn't for COVID, that wouldn't have happened. So travel demand's currently recovering very, very strongly, but there's still impediments right across that whole travel supply chain. So Jamie, if I can pass over to you now, um, what impediments are you seeing holding back the industry from that full recovery? Oh yeah, thanks. Thanks for letting me um, I, I think everything's different. Uh, mostly if you, it's around the region, so it's still supply. Uh, in Australia is really unique. Um, there's still a, the most lack of supply and the highest prices that, that haven't normalised yet. And I think, Screw, you'd, you'd agree with that. And that's just a function of, so, of supply and demand. So as the Chinese carriers come out here, and that will happen, it's happening pretty rapidly, that will change. Uh, and then I, I think, you know, talking about work from home is another big one. I mean, America's another unique situation where what's slowing it down is reliability. Uh, and work from homes, uh, somewhat of that. So reliability is, you know, I've been living in the States, day trips have evaporated because you're not sure if you might go from LA to San Francisco, you're going to get back and see the wife and kids. Sometimes maybe you don't, but you know, but um, that's the reality is that those things have, have gone away. Uh, and they're, so that's that's a function of two things. It's, it's resources to make it work um, because America's back over 100% and that's the problem. They just don't have the resources to manage what they've got. Uh, and then... I think China opening up and it's opening up very, very rapidly. So still some issues there with how they want to control that opening up. Um, but outside of that, there's the demands insatiable. So they're, they're the, probably the things. Okay. Linda? And Luke, um, what impediments is the RV industry seeing? Yeah, we're certainly seeing demand come back at a rapid rate. Our challenge is that during COVID, we defleeted because there was no point in having a big fleet of motorhomes sitting around in the yards if we didn't have the guests to, to rent them. So our combined fleet has gone from around 12,000 units down to a bit over 6,000. So our job over the next three or so years is to get back to where we were. And the demand is certainly there for that. The challenge is getting 
Uh, the supply chain working, Mercedes, Iveco, Renault are really struggling to bring in the chassis into the different markets where we operate for the coach builders ourselves and the big mega factories in, in the States to be able to get the product through to the rental dealerships so that we can expand the fleet again. So that's probably our biggest challenge is just the time, but in some ways that's also a good natural hedge because I think demand will be a bit lumpy over the next couple of years. So that'll slow down that rapid growth and it allows us to keep uh, the prices fairly high demand versus supply. And Scott, um, the other night, IATA, which is the airline industry body by way of background, uh, said that global airline capacity will con stay constrained until at least the end of 2025, just given all the difficulties with new aircraft deliveries, getting parts, etc. What's your view on that? No, I think that's pretty pretty accurate. Um, the, the big constraint on, on Alliance, we do have a, a very significant training program uh, operating and and what is slowing down the industry worldwide is uh, access to simulators. Um, and we've got one E190 simulator in Australia. We'll soon have three, which is going to be um, brilliant. And we've got two Fokker 100 simulators, um, one in Perth and one here in Brisbane. Um, and, and that really does constrain us. We're, we're sending pilots to um, Gatwick and Amsterdam for training. Uh, horribly expensive. Um, Yes, and yes, we have to buy affairs from those um, horrible international airlines that are charging way too much, but uh, that is what it is. Um, and we are having supply chain issues, um, uh, just uh, issues, issues like a um, uh, company that does our auxiliary power units um, don't have enough spare parts to, to fix them, um, and you can't can't fly an aeroplane without an auxiliary power unit. So. Uh, supply chain issues worldwide are constraining the industry um, and um, there's a whole range of um, issues with new aircraft, new engines and so on that, that are just slowing everything down and, and it's it really, there's, there's incredible demand as, as these guys know um, uh, and, and not enough supply and uh, therefore forces the price of everything up. Um, so basic economics really. Um, but that's, that, they're the things that are, uh, are our sort of major concerns is, is on the supply side is simulator capacity um, and, and spare parts, really. Um, so and, that, and, that's, and that's what I are saying, and they're, and they're right. So while you're in the hot seat, there's a lot of media reports, and we've heard other views today. Are the airlines price gouging us? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like that short chart. No, no, no. I, I, I knew this. I knew this question was coming, Belinda. In 1984, um, I, were, I, I started my life as a chartered accountant, believe it or not. Um, and back in the early early 80s, there was a um, rowing crew at the Brisbane Grammar School who was coxed by this bloke here, who didn't, who didn't go so well. Um, and and Jamie, that came from Brad Walker up there, mate, and bow too. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, and uh, I was in, I was, uh, I was in the, um, the work for Pete Marwick, now KPMG in Sydney. And my job uh, for two months was to go around all the travel agents in, uh, in Sydney and pose as a university student. Because back then, IATA were running a thing called the Yield Improvement Program, which the ACCC would absolutely hate now. So basically, you as a travel agent could not sell a ticket below a certain price. Otherwise, otherwise they remove your IATA um, accreditation. The airfare in 1984 to London and return was $1,788. You think about it now, you can still go to London for about the same money. I think, I think the airlines have done an incredible job, um, you know, with technology, all of the, all of the things you all know about anyway. Um, so I don't think they're price gouging and um, we pay our fuel bill our CFO, Mark Devine, put your hand up, Mark. He's got to pay our fuel bill every Tuesday morning. Um, and he's always got the shits on, on, uh, on Monday night because he knows how much money's going out of our bank account in the morning. <laughs> and, and, and the way our business is structured, we don't care what the fuel costs because our customers pay for it. But it's, 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 it's an enormous amount of money. And, uh, if you think it's about 35% of 
as an airline's cost is fuel. And they've got no control over it, really. Um, and everyone that hedges, hedges fuel gets it wrong. Um, and, and we don't because our, we don't have to. Um, but I, I think I think airfares are very reasonable. So screw is the catalyst really the Chinese airlines coming back with their, their lower airfares to bring down the overall market? Yeah, I do. Thanks for that, Alan. Oh, I win, Scotty. Yeah, I think Jamie mentioned that. I think the uh, Chinese carriers coming back, I think they're at about 25-30% already and they will, on an international basis, so they will certainly help bring those prices down even though probably the average um, the average person in the room here probably won't be flying uh, the Chinese carriers but uh, it probably will help and it's a supply and demand thing um, and, and obviously uh, as Alan said the oh, sorry uh, Scotty said the the price of fuel is quite important um, but it will make a difference I think we're at about 70 percent Jamie at the moment uh, capacity internationally um, and we think it'll probably be about 85 to 90 percent by Christmas uh, with the Chinese carriers obviously being a significant part of that I think pre-COVID are about 15 to 20 percent of it uh, but obviously generally pre-COVID it was mainly visitors coming from China so uh, but they, they will definitely have an impact but um, as you know the, the, that supply issue um, is not going to go away and um, I'm probably not quite as bearish as Scott on the um, timing I, I think sometime during next calendar year we'll, we won't be too far off it's certainly out of Australia globally it might be a slightly different story uh, to pre-COVID levels at least and Luke um, macroeconomic concerns um, are a worry for the market but is the travel industry really seeing any any slowdown what are you seeing in your global regions please well we're certainly not immune to higher interest rates inflation uh, pressures uh, around the world uh, but I think there's that huge pent up demand for people to want to travel again and that's flowing through. We're certainly seeing record bookings in the travel part of our business. Probably the, the only thing that we've noticed is that prices are not continuing to go up. They've stabilised now and they probably need to because we do have increased costs in the business to put a motorhome asset on the rental fleet has gone up in some cases 30 plus percent. So we need to get higher prices to be able to get the right return on the capital that we're deploying there. So we're really quite bullish on travel uh, because we've got uh, most of our guests are long haul travellers and they book months in advance. So we're seeing we've got this great window into the future and we're seeing the bookings come through at a rapid rate. The only thing that we're watching is what's happening on the used markets for caravans and motorhomes around the world. We're seeing prices hold up, but volumes have slowed down, which is probably a natural thing. They got a real boost during that COVID bubble and things are returning back to normal now. Okay, thank you. And Jamie, history shows that corporate travel is more impacted than leisure during tough economic times. Um, are you seeing any pockets of slowdown around the world? And then also, well, I've got you. Um, are you seeing any level, or what's this, everyone's worried about the structural impact of sort of from the teams and Zoom on corporate travel? What are you seeing there? Um, firstly, there's just no slowdown. I mean, it, it's funny, all you guys seem to look at the worst things, but we've been listed now for, I think, for 13 years, and without exception, um, corporate travel tends to move with GDP, the, the baseline, no matter what anyone makes up and conjures up, and nothing's, nothing's changed. We tend to see it early. I'd argue we saw it back in May and June last year. Um, we always see it before the market does, and I, I'd, 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 I'd expect that's what happened. Having said that, the recovery and the demand to travel far outweighs that, that impact. So I think it's not just us. I think everyone's saying the same thing. So are suppliers. So someone's right and someone's wrong. It seems to me that it doesn't seem to be there, and I think it's more a, a demand issue. Um, your second question is a bit early for me this morning. Um, <laughs> just on corporate travel uh, oh, yeah, impact on yeah. Zoom and Teams. Yeah, it, it's interesting because... I think we we've, we've do surveys all the way through this. We just did one a few weeks ago, um, and it's still mid-80s of why people travel for business. And, and if you think about it, it's really to either win business, to manage the supply chain, or bring your people together. Uh, we did that last week. We had our whole global team together for the first time, and it was great. We got so much out of it that we're a better business for it. So I guess the takeaway is 
what's happening with other 12 or 14 percent because that's roughly about 86 to 88 percent of all corporate travel now some of that will go away um some some things probably are better on zoom but clearly not you, you know problem solving challenges how you whiteboard things and so forth so i, I guess that when I step back, does that mean it's ever going to recover to 100 structurally? Probably not, but that's on 2019. So I think, what, what are we in now? 2023. And I think, without exception here, everyone's an organic growth model. So I, I, I think it's fairly safe to say that we've all grown a little bit more than 12 or 14% over the last few years. So, you know, the way we look at it, we're not really concerned. In our business, we are not talking about COVID or recoveries anymore because we're going to have a record profit. So now it's about next year. We just, we're back to old fashioned guidance, NPAT, all the things that probably matter in, in normal times. And um, yeah, and that's where we feel we are. So um, good to hear. Yeah. Now, Scott, you have a strong exposure to the regions, but even larger to the, the big resource sector. How are you seeing those areas performing? Mm. Um, pretty good. Um, the um, our customer base in the mining industry is, is all the big the big companies the Rio Tinto BHP um, Glencore etc and uh, none of them are going backwards um, and it'd be fair to say that um, and those sort of supply constraints that I mentioned earlier are holding us back a little bit um, and it, it, we wouldn't have one customer that doesn't want more services from us um, and um, so we we uh, typical fly in fly out contract. For us, it's sort of three to five years in duration, um, and we're just carrying people to and from uh, the mines. Um, the load factors on those are very high, um, and the only way they can get more pr more production, um, and you know the prices of, of, of everything that our customers mine is pretty good at the moment, and um, so they're just wanting to produce more and more. So, and uh, you know, it's uh, people talk about a bit, a bit like what Jamie just said. You know, people talk about downturns in the mining industry. Well, I'm 61, and I've never seen one. But the reality is, I think, you know, the, 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 there's, there's really three, two big industries in this country that I think the general public just do not understand that we're stuffed without it, which is agriculture and mining. Um, and uh, the mining industry is very strong, and I can't see that abating anytime soon. Now, gentlemen, I'd like you to just go down the line and all of you, if you can answer in one sentence, the biggest opportunity either for your business or the industry in the future, please. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, getting back to where we were pre-COVID and putting the two businesses together and realising the synergies. Fantastic, Scrooge. Oh, yeah, well, uh, we've, we've still got a year or two to go to get back to pre-COVID. So getting back over the next few years. Uh, the main thing is I want to get back to this before I die. So that's how <laughs> I'm a bit older than so. <laughs> you, left, you left a window there, mate. Just leave that on the line. Just a little bit from our side into the supply side, um, spare parts, um, uh, engines and, and, um, and so on, and simulator capacity. That's that's holding us back, and that's that's uh, that's uh, affecting every carrier, irrespective of whether you're a big international regular public transport carrier or someone like us. Um, that, that's the biggest constraint on us. Thanks, Scotty. Our uh, growth, really, we've got the scale now. Just growth. We're, we're focused totally on organic growth. Big market. We're still. It's really fragmented. So that we're we're really sort of in a different way. We're back to what we used to do. So that's good. Okay, now instead of uh, asking Ayata, I'm going to ask each of you, using your crystal ball, um, if you can all throw out to the audience one year you think travel demand will fully recover. So that's the global industry demand going back to 2019 levels. What year does it recover? Starting with Luke, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think demand is back already. It's the supply catching up and supply is probably in my mind, 2025, but the demand's already there. Yeah, I'd, I'd say something pretty similar. I mean, I know in our corporate business, uh, we'll be back to pre-COVID levels uh, by the end of April. So, you know, in terms of TDV and actual demand, certainly for us, and I think Jamie's the same, uh, we're pre it's pretty much back. The general market, I think the consensus is probably uh, business travel up to 80% probably at the moment, globally. And um, 
I, I think uh, I'll be a bit more optimistic. I, I think travel generally will be pretty much back to pre-COVID levels uh, by this Christmas, probably, early next year. Is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Scott? So I think West beat University last year in the Premiership, didn't we? Didn't they? Cliff Is that right? Yeah. Had to get it in somehow, mate. See you down at the kennel on, uh, on uh, um, I, I actually agree with Luke. I think 2025, and the best, best indicator of all, all these things is <clears throat> the, um, um, how, how Airbus uh, and Boeing are delivering aircraft. Boeing's in a real mess, um, and Airbus have got huge market share advantage over over Boeing now, and Boeing's got obviously got some issues now again with the 737 Max deliveries, um, and um, if, if you can't grow your business. That's, that's, uh, so I think just just look to what the backlog order backlogs are with with the two big manufacturers, um, and uh, it's fairly significant. So I think 2025. Yeah, thanks, Scotty. I mean, I already just put something out of last uh, last week that said pretty much everything's back in a 24, but they tend to have been a bit a, a bit ahead of themselves. So probably probably 25 or so. And it's right, it's all it's all supply chain, resources, all those sort of things. But um, that's the market and you just got to roll with it. But I guess for everyone here, that these sort of stocks, everyone's going to be growing for a few years above organic growth as it keeps coming back. That's why it's a good industry. And it's good to have four people here from Brisbane. It's crazy, isn't it? Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful to see. And gentlemen, just the last question before I hand over to the audience. Um, what's your favourite travel destination? Give us a hot travel tip, tip today. I'll screw you up talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, Spain. Probably, probably London's my favourite city. And uh, we do go to a place in Greece, okay, where you haven't been there for a while, Paros. So um, I... That's probably one of the best ones for a holiday. I love skiing overseas, but I've got to get a plug in for our business. Going away in a motorhome is honestly <laughs> the best experience that you'll ever have. <laughs> Australia, New Zealand, North America, UK, Apollo, Camper.com. <laughs> yeah, mine's a bit different. Argentina. There you go. Oh, any big city is good, and I think any beach is good, and any mountain is good. There's so many good things to do. So, I've, I'm going to get a plan. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your attendance. Thanks once again to the panel. <laughs> Terrific four companies, and we're very lucky to have them here, and uh, certainly led by some uh, terrific fellows who've uh, done a great job this morning. Sincerely, thanks again, and uh, thank you for your attendance, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you.